Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. So the case that I have for you guys today is going to be a bit of an update on a case that has since been solved since I covered it on my channel, which I believe was like two years ago at this point. It's always really cool to see movement in these cases and I want to make sure that I'm keeping you all updated on everything that comes out about any case that I have covered. I have seen updates on the cases involving Leah Croucher as well as others who I will be making more videos on in the coming weeks, so make sure you keep on the lookout for those updates, but for now, we are just going to focus on this one case. But for this video, I will be pretty much going over all of the details of this case again since I did cover it so long ago, but for even more detailed, more in-depth version of this case, make sure you go ahead and check out the original video that I made on this case. But if you do only watch this video, you'll pretty much get all of the details that you need to know about this case. But before I get into it, I wanted to go ahead and give a quick shout out to my patrons, Michelle, Maddie, Becca, Harmeen, Emily, and Eve. Thank you all so, so very much for your continued support of me and my channel. It truly means the world to me to have you all a part of the Patreon family. It's because of you guys and the rest of the Patreon family that I'm able to keep doing what I love and to keep spreading awareness on these very important cases. So once again, from the very bottom of my heart, thank you all so, so very much. Okay, so with that being said, let's get into today's case. Today, we're going to be discussing the now solved case of Robert Hoagland. Robert Hoagland was 50 years old when he went missing on July 28, 2013. He lived in Sandy Hook, Connecticut, and he was married to his wife, Lori, and together they had three sons. Sam, who is the youngest and was 21 years old at the time of the disappearance, Max, who was 23, and Chris, who was the oldest at 25 years old at the time. Robert, whose friends called him Hoagie, had actually met his wife, Lori, when they were in their early 20s when they were both in culinary arts school. They had their first son soon after they graduated, and they were married soon after that. Robert was known around the area to be a family man. He was known to always be spending time with his kids, and he loved spending as much time with them as he possibly could. For a while, however, he worked as a professional chef, but as you can imagine, the hours just were not ideal. He worked long, endless hours, and it came to a point where he felt like he was starting to miss out on the lives of his children. So back in 2001, he went back to school to become a real estate appraiser so that he could be self-employed and have a job that allowed him to be home more and spend more time with his kids and go to their sporting events and things like that. By 2012, he also decided to work at a friend's law firm. He didn't have a law degree and he didn't have a ton of experience with the field, but this friend just needed some help around the office, so he was happy to work there. Lori worked as a culinary arts teacher and the two seemed to have a very happy marriage. At one point, they did separate for about two years, but they came back together and they reconciled their differences and by the time Robert disappeared, the two had been saving for and planning their retirement together. However, they did have some troubles going on at home and with their children. Their middle child, Max, had struggled with substance use. By 2012, he was caught shoplifting so that he could sell the items to fund his drug habit. By early 2013, he ended up going to rehab, and once he got out, he went on to move in with his grandparents. But after a while, the grandparents also realized that they could no longer take care of Max, so he went back home to live with his parents that same year. Robert and Lori did their best to make sure that Max was headed on the right path and that he stayed healthy and clean, but they struggled with this just as any other parents would. Robert thought that Max was probably still using drugs at the time of his disappearance, even though he was doing whatever he could to prevent him from doing so. He would do things like hiding his keys and his wallet so that Max couldn't, you know, go behind his back and take those things from him to leave and do drugs. They were doing whatever they could to prevent Max from slipping back into this lifestyle. So now going into July, of 2013. Lori had gone on a two-week trip to Turkey with some of her best friends while Robert stayed back home. 
While she was gone, the two regularly maintained contact with each other and things seemed to be going pretty normal. Now, a few days before Lori was going to be returning back to the U.S., she had spoken with Robert asking him if he could pick her up from the airport and he agreed. The two had spoken again on the night of July 27th and he confirmed that he was going to be picking her up. Not only that, but Robert had also spoken to a few different friends and family members and he also mentioned that he was going to be picking up Lori from the airport in a couple of days. However, by that next day, Robert was nowhere to be found. Lori returned back to the U.S. from her trip, but Robert was not there to pick her up. She actually waited at the airport for two hours, but ultimately, she just decided to take a cab home. When she got home, of course, she was expecting to see him there. She was very upset and she was going to be like, dude, you forgot to pick me up from the airport. But when she got home, he was not there either. So, absolutely hysterical, she called around to friends and family members to see if anybody else had seen him, but nobody had. Then, another day passed without anybody hearing from Robert, so Lori reported him missing at around 7.30 p.m. on July 29th, 2013. When police came and searched around the house, nothing seemed to be out of place. The shoes that he always wore were still there and so were all of his clothes. None of his clothes appeared to be missing. His passport was where it should be and he also left behind his medication. He had also left behind his car keys and his wallet and his car was still there so nothing seemed to be missing. Then police also found that on the morning that he went missing, he stopped at a local bagel shop that morning, he then went to the gas station and while at the gas station, he actually purchased a map of the eastern United States. Now, he was someone who was very old-fashioned. He didn't use a GPS to get pretty much anywhere. So instead, if he was going to go somewhere that he didn't know how to get there, he would always buy maps instead of using his GPS. So at first, this could have been seen as something that was very suspicious. But it was also known that Robert had been planning on taking Max on a trip on the Appalachian Trail as sort of like a father-son bonding thing. So they thought that this probably was why he purchased this map. It didn't necessarily mean that Robert had left. Police also examined Robert's personal computer and they found out that there had been a program installed onto the computer which completely deleted all of his internet activity. When looking in his work computer, though, detectives had found that he had repeatedly searched one specific address in Rhode Island. However, when they followed up on this address, it turned out to be a dead end. Then, something else that was very strange was that on the morning of his disappearance, police found out that Robert had actually taken $600 out of his bank account from the ATM. Police also learned at this point that Robert did have a history of up and leaving his family. Now, 19 years previously, the Hoagland family packed up and moved across the country to California. Now, at this point in Lori and Robert's lives, they just wanted to follow their dream and move while their three boys were still very young but they didn't really have any money and it was a lot harder to find jobs than they had originally thought. Eventually, Robert did get a job as a chef at a country club and while he worked there, things seemed to be going very well for the family. However, there was one day where Robert got up and got ready for work as normal before telling Lori that he was going to be having a very busy day and that he would be home late. He acted completely normal this morning and told Lori that he loved her before leaving to go to work, but he didn't actually end up coming home. Pretty quickly, Lori found out that two days previously, he had lost his job at the country club. Robert left and he didn't come back for another three weeks after that. When he came back, he told his family that he was afraid and he was ashamed and he didn't know what to do since at that point, he couldn't provide for his family because he didn't have a job. However, when he did go missing at that time, he didn't keep it hidden very well. He took the family car. He used his credit cards and his bank account as normal and he was very easily trackable. So police weren't sure 
during this first disappearance if he was trying to stay hidden from everybody at that point or if he had left to try and make some money and send it back home to the kids before he ultimately decided to come back home. Also at this time, now in 2013, when he went missing for the second time, police didn't find anything to do with his job or anything with his financials to say that this could have been a reason that he left. But police did find out that right after Robert went missing, they found that Max, his middle son, had been out driving his car. Now, he was in an area known for drug use and Max admitted that he was in the area for drug use and there was a situation where he had trespassed in an area that was private property, so because of this, Max was arrested. While being held for his charges, he said that on the morning that Robert went missing, Max had borrowed his dad's car without his knowledge and without his permission. But by the time Max returned back home, he didn't see his dad anywhere. He tried calling him, but he wasn't answering and he wasn't able to get a hold of him. Now, going back even more, it turned out that while Lori was on her trip to Turkey, it came out that Max had been trying to sell some of Robert's things, including two laptops, most likely for drug money. During this time when Robert was sleeping, Max had taken Robert's keys and drove his car once again without his permission or his knowledge. He said that he brought these items to a building in Bridgeport and basically just left them there with the expectation that they were going to be there when he got back. But he said when he returned back to this building, these items were missing. So the assumption was, was that his friends who had also known about the building and who also used the building had stolen these items from Max. Well, Robert had actually found out about this, about his two missing laptops, and he went and confronted those men that were thought to have stolen these items. When they got to the building, Robert told Max to wait in the car and while he did, Robert went inside and confronted them, and there was an altercation between Robert and these men. So, knowing this situation, police weren't sure if he really did leave on his own accord, or if Max's involvement in drugs had something to do with Robert's disappearance. They thought that maybe these men who he had gotten into this altercation with had something to do with it. Maybe they attacked him at a later time and dumped his body somewhere. Maybe other people who, you know, Max owed money to were out to get him and instead of getting rid of Max, they got rid of his father as a threat or some sort of message. That's what they thought at first. That's one of the theories that they were initially looking into. But either way, they did continue their investigation and looking into all possible leads. And by September of that year, somebody called into the police saying that they saw someone fitting Robert's description living in Rhode Island. There were other sightings of Robert, one of which was in New York, but the family and law enforcement weren't sure what to make of them. They followed up on these sightings and none of them were able to be confirmed and, you know, Robert looks like your typical white middle-aged dad. So, no one was really sure what to make of these sightings, if they were truly him, or if they were just people who looked a lot like him. Three years after the disappearance, his case was featured on Investigation Discovery's show Disappeared, with his episode being titled A Family Man. Everyone on the episode, including his family and law enforcement, were not convinced that he would have just left his kids. There was no way that he would just take off and leave his wife behind to deal with the kids and the bills and everything else in their lives. By the time I covered this case, like I said about two years ago, people still were not sure. People thought that there probably was a chance that some sort of drugs or Max's involvement with certain people were responsible for Robert's disappearance. Nobody thought that he would have just up and left. However, by December of last year, which is crazy to say, this is going to be going out early January, but last year, 2022, the long-awaited questions have finally been answered. Robert had been found. On Monday, December 5th of last year, police responded to a call regarding the untimely death of a 59-year-old man at a residence in Rock Hill, New York. 
Rock Hill is a small town with about 2,000 people located about two hours away from New York City. When police first entered the residence for this call, they found the man who had been deceased. Now, when they were looking around the room to find papers to see who this man was, they originally found some papers with the name Richard King, but ultimately, they found papers with the name Robert Hoagland on them. So, at first, this was the only information that was released, which is why I took a little bit to cover this case because you know, all we knew for a while was that there were these papers found in this deceased man's room with his name on them, so it was assumed that this man, of course, was Robert Hoagland. But after this came out, we find out a lot more about what Robert was up to for the previous 10 years based on information provided by his former roommate, who is only being identified by his first name, Dave. So, Dave said that he met Robert, who was living under the name Richard, about 10 years prior, so I'm going to be referring to him as Richard for the time being. Dave said that back in 2013, he had put an ad on Craigslist seeking a roommate. His marriage was ending, so he was looking for somebody to move in with him and split the bills with him. This is when a man named Richard King responded. He told Dave that he had also just recently split up with his wife and that he was new to the area. Dave had been working as a music teacher, and he too was relatively new to the area, only having lived there for about a year. When the two met, Richard had no forms of ID. To explain this, Richard told David that he left his ID behind. He said that he left everything behind when he left his wife. He just wanted to start new and completely start over. But Richard had already been working for the Empire Inspections and Appraisal, a small real estate appraisal firm. Now, nobody under the name Richard King had actually been licensed as a real estate appraiser in New York. However, David confirmed that Richard was working as a contractor for the company. The company had someone working there who David knew and who was able to vouch for Richard. One of Richard's co-workers reported that Richard was a great guy. He was a good worker and he seemed like your average typical man. His employer was reached out to, but they did not respond for comment. So, given that people around David were vouching for Richard, he agreed to move in with him as his roommate. David recalls that when Richard moved into his house, he barely had any possessions. He only had clothing, some accessories, and a small bed. That's pretty much it. Richard moved into the spare bedroom in the house that David was renting, and this was sort of an under-the-table sort of deal. David was not supposed to be renting out that room according to the lease that David had signed with his wife. So, that meant that Richard would not have to provide an ID or anything else to do a background check or a credit check. The owner of the house would later say that he never knew that a second person was living in the house, they only knew about David, who had renewed the lease under his own name, so this entire time, the owner of this house had no idea about Richard's existence. Then, Richard used a car that was loaned to him from his place of work. Richard always paid for everything in cash and never caused any other problems for David or anybody else around him. Him and David grew close as friends, and the two lived together for the following nine years. Dave said that he actually thought of Richard as a brother. So, in 2020, when David purchased his own home less than a mile away from where they were already living, David asked Richard if he'd like to continue living together. And, of course, he said yes. This entire time, the two had just grown into their routines together and went about their lives. David never had any reason to think that Richard was anybody else other than who he claimed to be. Here are photos of Richard from 2020 and a photo of the house that they had been living in. They would watch sports together every Sunday and eat dinners together every Sunday. Richard would always cook and he taught David how to cook as he knew his way around a kitchen pretty well. They would always do all of these different activities together. Now, they didn't really celebrate their birthdays or anything like that but they did exchange Christmas gifts every year. David noticed that Richard didn't have a great phone, so he gifted him his old iPhone. 
Then David added Richard to his own cell phone plan under his name. So David had two lines, both under his name, but one of the phones was being used by Richard. David was so close to Richard and saw him as a brother, like I said. He would even talk to his mom on the phone about Richard. But Richard told David very little about himself over the years. He told him that he had two sons, one of which he enjoyed working on the car with. The other, he said, struggled with addiction, even though we know he did have, you know, three sons. But he talked about how he enjoyed going on family trips to Hilton Head in South Carolina. But that was pretty much all David knew about Richard's past life. Those who lived in the community around Richard said that he was a quiet, quirky guy. Those who knew him from a local bar that he went to said that he was very slow to warm up and he mostly kept to himself. He didn't work in Rock Hill, but he did often volunteer at the local soup kitchen during the holidays. One fellow volunteer said that from 2017 to 2019, he always volunteered to cook Thanksgiving and Christmas dinners at the local soup kitchen. Once again, others who knew him said that he was quiet and quirky, but he definitely knew his way around a kitchen and he was an excellent cook. On the evening of Friday, December 5th, David returned home from his work and he went to bed early. He said that Richard often worked on Saturdays, so December 6th, and so he woke up expecting to see that Richard had left for work as he normally did, but he hadn't. He saw that Richard's car was still parked in the garage, which was very unusual. At first, David was a bit worried, but he thought that maybe Richard had just taken this Saturday off. But the next day, on Sunday, December 7th, when Richard did not show up for their weekly Sunday dinner, he knew that something was off. Then, the following day, he found out that Richard still did not show up for work. So, David started calling and texting Richard all day, but the texts and calls were all going unanswered. While Dave was at work that day, he asked another friend to stop over at the house to see if Richard would answer the door, but he also got no response. Finally, when Dave got home from work on that Monday, he went into Richard's bedroom. He opened the door and walked into Richard's room and found that Richard was laying in bed face up with his eye mask on and his arms crossed over his chest and he was not breathing. David attempted to resuscitate him with CPR, but it was of no use. He had already died by that point. Of course, he did call the police, who came over and started their investigation. As I stated before, they looked around for papers with Richard's name on them, but they ended up finding mail addressed to somebody named Robert Hoagland. Dave actually told detectives that Richard had told him that previous week that he was going to be receiving mail with a different name on it. He didn't provide any additional information, and David didn't want to pry. But now, after finding this out, after finding, you know, this mail, he decided to Google the name Richard Hoagland. That is when he found out that somebody with the same name had gone missing from Newton, Connecticut almost 10 years prior, right before the two met each other. And Dave recognized Richard as being identical to the man that had gone missing. Dave said to detectives that maybe the reason why Richard was starting to get mail with his real name on it was because he was trying to get on Medicaid or some sort of insurance for better medical care. David said that about six months prior, Richard had told him that he was told by a doctor to change his diet, so he did. But David said that his overall health seemed to be declining and he was starting to try and get more medical care. After finding out that his roommate and friend of over 10 years was a completely different person, obviously David was shocked and confused. He had no idea why somebody would want to up and leave his life the way that Richard did, but he did say that Richard must have had a pretty great reason for doing so. He added that Richard or Robert lived a very slow, simple life, 
and that is why he thinks he was able to keep his identity a secret for so long. When Robert's family found out about this whole revelation, his wife and his sons, Max and Sam, did not respond to a request for comment. However, their oldest son, Christopher, did comment. He basically said that this whole situation is just very confusing. They're really just trying to handle everything. They don't really know what to make of these details and they don't really know anything else beyond this or why he would have left or anything like that. That, as far as we know, is all the family had to say about that. Neighbors who knew Robert before he left are also very confused about all of this. They knew Robert as a family man. They knew Robert as somebody who would never do anything like this. So people are just really confused about the entire thing. According to an autopsy, there was no evidence of foul play relating to Robert's death. It seems like he was just declining in his overall health and he was struggling to get healthcare because of the identity issue. So he probably died of some sort of illness. Some reports that I saw said that he died as a result of cardiac arrest, so I think that is most likely his cause of death, though I don't want to state it as official fact since I only saw it reported in one source and I haven't been able to read the full autopsy report. Police also said that there is no criminal aspect to Robert's disappearance, but they said that no further information will be released out of respect for Robert's family, which... I kind of don't understand that part of it. I don't see how there's no criminal aspect to this when he left his family and he left them with all of the bills, everything that he, you know, all the liabilities that he had, everything that he owned was now left to his wife, which I don't get how that is not criminal, making her pay for everything and not having to pay for, you know, things that they were paying for together, like their house and things like that. So I don't really understand that aspect of it, but there was no child support needed because the children were all adults. So maybe that's most of it. I don't really know. So that's pretty much all we know for this case right now. I do think this is a very clear cut and dry case at this point with this new information. I think that Robert had some sort of mental break where he just felt like he couldn't handle things that were happening with his life and with his family, so he just up and left them. I'm really happy that this roommate came forward to give us all the details about what he had been doing in his life before he was found deceased because otherwise, all we really knew was that he was just living in this house. We didn't know anything else, so now we sort of know a lot more. We don't know exactly why he left, but I don't know if we're ever going to know his reasons. It's crazy to me that somebody can just be gone for that long without as much as reaching out to his children. It kind of is disgusting in my opinion. Obviously, we shouldn't speak ill of the dead, but in this case, Robert is not a victim in my opinion. His wife and his children are. I just think it's crazy that a man can just up and leave his life like it's nothing and for 10 years just have no contact with his three children it's unfathomable to me. I think if this was a situation where he wasn't married and he didn't have children and he just had this longtime girlfriend and he just left, sure, I wouldn't think he's, you know, a bad person or anything like that, but I think the fact that he had three children who missed him, you know, he knew, I guarantee he knew that all of these people were looking for him. I wonder if he saw the video that I made about him. I wonder if he saw the episode of Disappear that was made about him and I wonder why through all of that, he didn't bother to reach out to anybody. He didn't want anybody to know that he was alive. Maybe he sent like encrypted messages to his children that, you know, they just didn't make sense of, or maybe they just don't want to tell us, which if they don't, that's none of our business anyways. But I really can't understand how someone could go through all of this, see that their family is searching for them, and still just not contact them and stay away for so long. It's also really crazy. I don't know if anybody else has made this connection, but I also covered a case involving a man named Richard Hoagland. And in this case, he did run away his family and he wasn't found until over 20 years later. The Hoagland name and the name Richard must just have something cursed about it or something because that is just a crazy coincidence. I remember, I think I covered Robert's case first and then I covered Richard's. I don't know which one, but I remember when searching one, I found the other and I was like, 
this is crazy. And I really didn't think at the time that Robert had run away, even though there were certain things pointing towards that. I just wasn't sure. And then I found out that this other guy with the same last name did run away. That's just a crazy coincidence to me. I'm not someone who often believes in coincidences, but this one it's crazy. It's just like the Peterson last name. A lot of the people, you know, Lacey Peterson, Stacey Peterson, Kathleen Peterson, all, you know, victims allegedly from their husbands. So some last names I just think are cursed. I also just want to note, as a side note, something that just popped into my head that there's no criminal aspect to this case when, you know, Robert left, but also there were a lot of resources, tax dollars, money put into the searches for him. So I don't see how that's not criminal. But I guess since he's deceased, there's no way that he could pay that back anyways, because obviously we know the case of Sherry Papini, where she claimed that she had been kidnapped and obviously all these efforts were put into searching for her and now she has to pay back all of the money that was spent searching for her. I wonder if the only reason that this isn't an issue is because he is deceased. I don't really know if he was alive and he was found out. I don't know if he would still have to pay for it because he didn't technically lie and say that he had been kidnapped. I don't really know. If you guys know more about this, let me know. But to me, I don't see how there's no criminal aspect to this case. But either way, I am happy that we do have a conclusion to this case. Obviously, it is technically a best case scenario when it comes to cases like this, where obviously we would rather see that this person just left their life rather than them being harmed by somebody else. But still, this doesn't sit right with me. But it does give us a good look into some of these cases, some of these cases, someone truly left their life, someone truly just went and didn't want to be contacted ever again. So it definitely sheds a light on that aspect of the case that not everything has some criminal component to it. But either way, that is all I have for today's video. And now I want to know what you guys think. What do you think would just cause somebody to up and leave their life like this? Let's discuss this and any other thoughts that you have in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn the notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you go ahead and follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. And if you do wish to join the Patreon family, that will also be linked down below. If you have absolutely any case suggestions for a case that you'd like to see come Covered on this channel, make sure you go ahead and fill out the Google form, which is listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye!